today's program, we have Dr. Boster. Dr. Boster is going to speak about, well, he's going to speak about multiple sclerosis, of course, right? And a little bit on telehealth and symptom management, understanding COVID-19, and he will speak about things to do with access to care. Tonight's supporter, we have Genentech. Genentech is the company that supported tonight's program, and we all want to thank them, right? Everybody out here wants to say thank you. Great. Awesome. All right. Dr. Boster is going to present for approximately... 45 minutes, okay, and then we will do a 35 or 40 minute Q&A and we'll get started. I don't want to delay any more time. Dr. Boster, why don't you come on up? Thank you very much. Dr. Boster is the medical director of the Boster MS Center in Columbus, Ohio. He's a great guy. He's got a lot of patience and I love to see him. That's why I come back to Ohio so much. Thank you. Really see you here. soon. I'll give you a hug. Ah, you give me a hug, Howdy, my name's Aaron Boster. I'm an MS neurologist from sunny Columbus, Ohio. I started the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis two days before the governor of Ohio saw fit to close the state. And so my new standalone MS center has perfectly mirrored the COVID-19 pandemic. It's been rather remarkable. So I like to tell my team our story's not boring. I decided to do MS when I was 12 years old, which is maybe not when most doctors make a decision to go into medicine. I wasn't making a decision to going into medicine. I just knew that nobody should treat my uncle as poorly as he was being treated and nobody should make my family feel so scared and alone. And this predates programs like tonight. It predates the interwebs actually. It predates medicines that are available to treat MS. And I watched my uncle deteriorate through what we now call the natural history of multiple sclerosis. That's a very ugly way of saying, if I don't do anything, what happens to you? And so that, I learned about helping someone transfer into a chair, or I learned about disimpacting someone, or I learned about trigeminal neuralgia pain long before I knew what those words meant, or before I knew about neuroimmunology. I've had a very, very directed course. I was the weirdo in high school that said, I want to be an MS doc when I grow up. And in some ways, it's become almost a, a mission-driven passion to help educate and to energize and empower families impacted by MS. Honestly, because nobody did that for my family, so I'm gonna do it for yours. So that's my introduction. Pass those things up and let's have a chit chat about multiple sclerosis and I can't wait to see what you wanna talk about. Here we go. I would sing for you while we're waiting, but then you would leave the room. Thank you. All right, now, let's see what I can put together. We I'm gonna read all these out. Fatigue and invisible symptoms. I'm 70, is it safe to come off my disease-modifying therapy? So treatment and age. A cure for MS, international registries. Where do we go after 30 years? Resources that are up to date. The continuum with multiple sclerosis and neurological problems, so more symptoms, fantastic. Motor fatigue and spasticity management. Immune system with meds, do all relapsing remitting MS end up in a worse case if you treat MS? And so we'll talk about sort of expectations for secondary progressive MS, and this one says SPMS. All right, and if we have a couple from online, then we're gonna put them together. First one, you have to repeat, mobility issues. So online, they're asking here about mobility issues. Sex. Oh, a favorite topic of mine getting down, or I'm sorry, sexual uh, relations. Um, the other one is, uh, about, wanting to know more about the back pump mechanism. Back and pump, okay. All right, so I'm gonna take all of those things and spin around a circle three times and deliver a lecture on all those topics. Ready? Howdy! Welcome tonight. Who's excited to be here? Raise your hand. The people online cannot see you, so scream out loud if you're excited to be here tonight. <laughs> Woohoo! I am delighted to present to you on a topic that I've prepared. That's not true. On a topic that I've prepared on how to make MS boring. Today we're going to talk about how do you make multiple sclerosis boring. Anybody want to learn how to make MS boring? Only one person in the back of the room was excited to make MS boring. All right, can we try that again? Now, this is really not like a real question. It's kind of rhetorical. You're supposed to scream and yell now that you know what you're supposed to do. Who wants to learn how to make MS boring? Yeah. Oh, that, well, you, you tried so much harder. Thank you very much. 
I am asked very often, hey, Dr. B, when will we have a cure for multiple sclerosis? That was a question that was sent up here. When are we gonna have a cure for MS? And very humbly, I don't think that we're gonna see a cure in my lifetime. And I'm not trying to say that to be sassy pants or mean or be disparaging. Our understanding of the immune system is better than it was 10 years ago, but we still don't fully understand how the immune system works. We only very recently figured out how to touch the innate immune response. That's half of the immune system we've never been able to reach. Our understanding of the underpinnings of this disease are growing, and I don't think that we're gonna have a full ability to put the brakes on it until we understand it better. Now, before you think, well, gosh, Aaron, that's kind of a Debbie Downer presentation. Today, 2022, if we play our cards right, we can actually make multiple sclerosis boring. We can do that now. And I wanna remind you of another autoimmune condition called diabetes. Show of hands if you're familiar with diabetes, right? So that's an autoimmune condition where the immune system attacks the pancreas and then you don't make insulin. Did you guys know that diabetes used to be a death sentence? Just a couple generations ago, if you had diabetes, you would go into renal failure within 30 years and pass away. Nowadays, you don't know that your girlfriend has diabetes unless you happen to have chocolate cake with lunch. And then she reaches into her purse and pulls out her little, say, oh, sweetie, what are you doing? Oh, nothing, I'm just giving myself my insulin so I can enjoy some chocolate cake. I didn't know you had diabetes. Oh, yes, girl. If you play your cards right, you can make having diabetes boring. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, it's not easy. That person who took the insulin, she had to figure out the dosing, she has to take medicines on a regular basis, she has to commit to a lifestyle that keeps her healthy, but she can have a, a very, very full life and live a long time. And today, 2022, we can do that with multiple sclerosis, and that's what I wanna talk about today. Let's talk about how do you make MS boring? Right. The first thing that we need to do if we're gonna make MS boring is we're gonna to have to do something to identify attacks when they occur and treat them to get us better faster. What's an attack? A flare, an exacerbation, a relapse, it's all the same thing. That's when something real bad happens to you and you try to hide it from your spouse for a couple days and you have to come clean that you really can't feel your leg or that you can't see out of your right eye. An attack is when you have new neurological dysfunction because the immune system attacked part of the holiest of holies, the supercomputer that runs the body, and short-circuited a function. And in the setting of multiple sclerosis, we don't plan for an attack, it can just happen. And we have to be ready to make that attack boring. How do we do that? First thing we do is you apply the 24-hour rule. What's the 24-hour rule? The 24-hour rule is as follows. If you have a neurological symptom that lasts less than 24 hours, it's less likely to be related to MS. If you have a neurological symptom, a new one that lasts longer than 24 hours, now I want a phone call. Let me explain why. MS disease activity, particularly attacks, are caused by inflammation. So if you like socked me in my jaw and my face got all puffy, tomorrow it's more puffy, right? Because the inflammation in my cheek doesn't go away in a day, it takes longer than that. And if you have an MS attack, it's caused by inflammation in the noggin or the spinal cord, those symptoms are gonna last for longer than a day. So as we try to make MS boring, we have to be able to discern, do I have to call Dr. B or not? And if you wake up and your hand's numb and you shake it out and it feels better, you don't have to call me. But if you wake up and your hand's numb and you shake it and it's still numb and the next day it's more numb, now I need a phone call. We're applying the 24 hour rule. The next thing that we need to do, if we find out that we have a new neurological symptom that we're not liking very much and it's sticking around for longer than a day, we have to rule out an infection. Infections are nasty little creatures when it comes to multiple sclerosis because you can have a little urinary tract infection that you're not even fully aware of and it can make your old neurological symptoms come back out and wave and say hello, howdy, hi. Why? That's because when you have an infection, even an occult urinary tract infection, you raise your core body temperature a little and you can short circuit old areas of damage. And so the first thing we need to do when we see neurological symptoms is we need to check a urinalysis actually, make sure you don't have a UTI, make sure you're not infected. I can't tell you how many times I get a phone call from a patient who says, Dr. B, I think I'm having an attack. We bring them in and examine them, they have COVID. So I'm really glad I didn't give them steroids for an attack because that's not what the problem was. Now, if we find out that you're having new neurological symptoms and you're not having infection, <clears throat> then we can give lotions and potions to hasten your recovery. We can give steroids, 
and they come in all kinds of different flavors. We can do it IV at your home. We can do it IV at my clinic. We can do it IV local to you in an infusion center. We can do high dose oral medicines. There's even other injectable medicines that take the place of steroids. My point is, I wanna get you back in the game. And if your leg's numb and it's making you at risk of falling, that's not boring. The way we're gonna make it boring is we're gonna give you steroids and we're gonna hasten your recovery and get you back in play. Now, one more thing I wanna say about an attack. If you are taking an MS medicine, the goal of the medicine is not to have an attack, right? That's why you take the medicine. And if you have an attack on the medicine, something ain't right. Think about it. If you're taking a birth control pill and you get pregnant, it didn't work. Because the point of the birth control pill is to prevent an unplanned event, an unplanned pregnancy. And so if you're taking a medicine the way you're supposed to and then you have an attack, well, something ain't right. And so after we're done treating the attack, we need to bring you back in clinic because that's not boring. And we need to look at your disease-modifying therapy and see if everything's copacetic or if we need to change what we're doing. Treating an attack is one of the many ways that we can make MS boring. What's another way to make MS boring? We can treat symptoms. Many of you, when you wrote in, you wrote about symptoms. I've got questions about fatigue, about invisible symptoms. I have questions about spasticity. I have questions about pain management and motor fatigue. So let's take the topic of invisible symptoms and talk about that. Oh, honey, I didn't know you were sick. Oh, sweetheart, you look so good. Oh, are you better now? Is the MS better, honey? If you had a dollar every time someone with good intention said something like that, maybe you could buy all of our meals tonight, right? It's a very, very common thing I hear in clinic. With some, oh, sweetie, you don't look sick. You look so good. So much of MS pathology is invisible. The number one symptom in multiple sclerosis, in fact, the leading cause of loss of work in MS is fatigue. And it's not a normal fatigue. Now, if you come home at night and say, hey, honey, I'm tired, the immediate response is, yeah, me too, right? But that doesn't cut it when we're talking about MS fatigue. Now, I don't have MS, but I spend a lot of time talking to folks with MS, and this is the best example I've come up with, trying to help a spouse understand fatigue. And you tell me how off I am. Monday, go to work, have a great day at the job, come home, have dinner with your family, and don't go to bed that night. Start to watch Aaron Boster's YouTube channel, right? And watch YouTube videos all night long, don't go to sleep, Wake up in the morning, you don't have to wake up, you never went to bed. Take a shower, go to work on Tuesday. Tuesday, come home from work, eat dinner. You didn't watch all my videos, so finish watching them. Don't go to bed Tuesday night. Wednesday morning, we're gonna go for a walk and talk about fatigue. It's a pathologic fatigue where it's hard to stay awake and stay looking at someone and keep your eyes open. And it's the leading cause of loss of work and it is not boring and you can't see it. And something else that's nasty about fatigue is that fatigue impacts other symptoms. It actually impacts the triad of the up there's. The up there's are invisible symptoms to include thinking and memory, energy and mood. And guess what? All three of those invisible symptoms are tied together with a bow. And so if you have pathologic fatigue, it will make your mood worse. If you have pathologic fatigue, you will not think as clearly. But here's the good news. If we treat your fatigue, we not only give you more energy, we improve your thinking and memory and we improve your mood. The up there's are some very, very serious invisible symptoms. We can also talk about the down there's. There was a question about the down there's. Wanna talk about sex, woo wee, during dinner even. And the down there's are invisible also. We don't talk about the down there's, right? And yet in MS, it's not uncommon that someone can have a difficulty controlling their bladder. Where when they need to go, they've got about one second to get to the bathroom and get their pants down or they're gonna go anyways. And a lot of people will have to make plans. They need to know where every bathroom is. Or sometimes they're so concerned they won't leave their home. Other people can't empty their bladder. Those are invisible symptoms, but they prevent people from leaving the home. Bowels are even worse. No adult human wants to lose control of their bowels. And MS can do that at times. Sexual dysfunction is actually very common in MS. I'm gonna introduce a term called dyspareunia. That means that sexual sensation hurts, right? Now these are invisible symptoms and they're a little bit socially taboo, aren't they? 
And so that means that many of us might not be comfortable even bringing them up to our doctor. And so what ends up happening is we don't know what's going on because I can't see you pee. And you're kind of hiding it and it's invisible and it's eroding the quality of your life. So there's a lot of things that we can do to treat the up there's and the down there's, these invisible symptoms. Let's go through a little bit of how we treat the up there's and the down there's. As it relates to energy, let's come up with three things we can do. Exercise, sounds paradoxical. If you exercise as part of your lifestyle, your energy levels skyrocket. If you don't believe me, I double dog dare you to try it. Number two, cutting sugar out of your diet. What? Yeah, seriously. And if you don't believe me, try it for a week. Remove all excess sugar out of your diet and see what happens to your energy level. I'm an allopathic doctor. I prescribe medicines for a living, so I'll throw out a medicine. There's a medicine called modafinil, all right? The trade name in the United States is ProVigil. And this is a medicine that tricks your brain into being more awake. It can make the difference between being engaged in a conversation and doing a good job in the workplace or making errors without intention. My point is there's a lot of things we can do to help with energy. And when you help with energy, you help with thinking and memory because that, that medicine, that provigil that I talked about, it also helps improve attention and performance, which is really, really awesome. I use it a tremendous amount with my patients when they need to be in it to win it. Mood is a major issue and it's only gotten worse with a global viral pandemic. We have never faced such a mental health crisis as we're dealing with right now in the United States, it's a fact. And people impacted by MS are twice as likely to experience depression or anxiety at some point in their life. And so that's bothersome, but then when you learn that people impacted by MS who are depressed and it's not treated, their disease gets worse faster. That terrifies me. It really makes me wanna make sure that we're talking about mood and that we're doing the very best job we can to improve your mood. How do we do that? I'll come up with three more ways. Get a dog. There's excellent evidence that having a dog improves mood. And what's interesting is it didn't hold true with a cat. <laughs> I, I, I'm just telling you the data. Antidepressants are outstanding at helping with mood. And they can help with energy. There's a lot of things that we can do. I'll throw in a third one, get more sleep. What? Seriously, if you wanna improve your mood, add an extra hour of sleep to your life and see what happens. There's a lot of things that we can do to treat the up there's. Let's talk about how we treat the down there's. If you have trouble because you have to sprint to the bathroom and you can barely get there in time, then we can do something to outsmart your bladder. Your bladder's filling and it's not telling you, all right? Because your spinal cord damage from MS makes it so it's not letting you know that it's filling and it's filling and it's filling until it's too full. But what you can do is you can do an experiment and see how long can I wait before I have to go pee pee, right? And so you say, okay, well, I can go an hour, but if I go two hours, there's a chance I may run to the bathroom. All right, well then here's the dealio. When you're awake at the top of every hour, go tinkle. Go to the bathroom, sit on the toilet, see if you can pee. Sometimes you're not gonna need to go. Sometimes you're gonna shock yourself and your bladder was full and you didn't realize it. Now if you start to do that, you'll realize, Aaron, I don't need to go once every hour, but I do need to go once every hour and a half. Okay, then once hour and a half, set your smartphone and go pee. And if you stay in front of the problem, you'll never ever be wet. That's a pretty big deal. Let me share a second tip with you that doesn't involve a medication. You make urine for six hours after you drink something. So I'm gonna make urine for six more hours. Now if I drink a glass of water at 10 p.m. and go to bed, 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, 4 a.m., I'm making urine the whole time. And then I wonder why I wake up three times to pee. So that can really create a problem. People can wet themselves in their bed, or they can stumble scurrying to try to get to the bathroom in the dark, and they don't get restored to sleep because they're waking up all the time. So what do we do? I want you to drink two thirds of all the water you're gonna drink in the first half of your day. If you drink two thirds of all the water you're supposed to drink in the first half of your day, and then you put a relative hard stop after the dinner hour, you're not gonna be going to bed making urine. Now don't walk around at night going <laughs> I hate Aaron. No, I mean, if you need to take some medicine, take a sip of water, but my point is you wanna stack the water in the beginning of the day so that you're not thirsty at night and drinking lots of water and carrying a water bottle to the bedside table. Those are two behavioral things you can do to help your bladder. Let me add a third. 
There are all those commercials for gotta go, gotta go right now. You seen those commercials? Those commercials are for medicines that uh, relax the bladder. The bladder is like a, a ball, and in the setting of MS, it can spasm down to the size of like a racquetball. So you drink half a Coke and it's over, you're full, you gotta run to the bathroom. When you take these gotta go right now medicines, they relax the bladder to a normal size so you can hold a normal amount of urine and finish the TV show and then casually get up and go to the bathroom, which is what we wanna do. Symptoms are real even if they're invisible. And if you take nothing else home from my discussion today in an attempt at making MS boring, I want to empower you to be a little bit selfish. You need to be a little bit selfish. When someone comes into clinic to see me, I start the clinic by saying, how you doing? And almost always I say, I'm great. I'm doing good. Good doc, how are you doing? And then I say, are you being socially polite or are you really doing good? And more often than not, they say, actually I'm doing really bad. I say, okay, well that's where we need to start. Because this is not a social engagement. We're gaming out how to win, how to live your best life despite having a mess. We're gaming out how to make this boring. You have to tell me that you're peeing your pants. If I don't know that, I cannot help you. You have to tell me that you can't achieve orgasm or I can't help you. You have to tell me that you're having trouble at work getting through reading stuff or I can't help you. So you need to be selfish. Say, oh, I don't want to complain. Or I understand that. Because if you complain at the dinner table, then nobody wants to eat dinner with you. And if you complain in the lunchroom, people are gonna walk away. But in the doctor's office, the doors are closed. This is time for you to be selfish and to be a self-advocate and to say, I would like to not pee my pants anymore. Thank you. And that is a key way of making MS boring. So far, we've talked about making MS boring by identifying an attack and treating it. We've talked about making MS boring by treating symptoms to include invisible symptoms, such as the up there's, energy, mood, thinking, and memory, and the down there's, bowel, bladder, and sexual function. How else can we make MS boring? Now there's another symptom on here that I wanna talk about before I move on, and that's a symptom of spasticity. Spasticity is a situation where your muscles no longer play nicely together, right? So if I want to bring this cup of vodka to my mouth, I have to flex my massive bicep, but I also have to relax that massive tricep back there, all right? So I've got to flex the bicep and relax the tricep. Ah, it's really good vodka. It's water. And the, the tricep relaxes on its own. I don't tell the tricep to relax. I just say, hmm, water. The spinal cord and brain turn the tricep off so that the bicep can move without the tricep fighting. In the setting of MS where there's damage to the supercomputer that runs the tricep and the superhighway that brings the information from the supercomputer to the tricep, when that gets damaged, the tricep doesn't get the memo. So when you wanna do this, your tricep, it didn't know that, it's still trying to do that. So you're trying to do this and you're trying to do that at the same time, and what happens? You have spasms, you have a cramp, you have charley horses, you have limbs that are hard to bend, that's spasticity. Spasticity occurs in about 70% of people with MS. Stuart lives down in Florida. We live up in Ohio, and we have something that he doesn't. Cold. During the winter months, it gets real cold in Ohio, and I watch spasticity go through the roof because spasticity is intensified by two things. Cold temperatures and being still. So waking up in Ohio in February is a recipe for being really, really stiff when you get out of bed. Now, let's talk real quick about how we manage spasticity. The first thing I want you to do is I want you to stretch when you wake up before you exit your bedroom. That's not asking too much of you. You just get on your bed or on the floor and stretch out for five minutes. You can put on a yoga DVD or type into YouTube stretch or just remember track practice. You wanna stretch out your butt and your back and your hamstrings, quadriceps. If you do that, it's gonna help you not be so spastic for the next three hours and it's free. Then I want you to stretch when you get into the bedroom before you climb in bed at night, right? Again, not that big of a deal, you're in bed. I mean, if you're gonna get lucky, then it's foreplay. If not, then you stretch out before you go to sleep. And that's gonna decrease the risk of spasms and cramps when you're in bed going to sleep. Then I simply need you to stretch once in the middle of your day. One time, that's all. One time during lunch, you're at a lunch break, you're going to kind of stretch out a little bit. If I can teach you to stretch thrice during the day, we're on our way to managing spasticity in a really impactful fashion. The second thing I need you to do is figure out, just like with your bladder, how long can I sit before I get stiff? 
I can sit for about 40 minutes, then my leg tightens up. Just like with the bladder recommendation, at the top of every hour, or just beforehand, you need to get up and do a lap. Now, oftentimes, you can kill two birds with one stone and get up, walk to the bathroom, go pee-pee, and walk back down. Now your legs are stretched and your bladder's empty. Those are two things that you can do to help with spasticity big time. I'll throw in a medicine just for good measure, medicine called baclofen. I like baclofen a lot. One time a patient was mad at me and called me Dr. Baclofen. <laughs> I thought it was cute. Baclofen is a chemical which mimics a neurotransmitter called GABA. GABA is what tells the tricep to stop, and you're missing it because of spinal cord damage because of MS. If you swallow baclofen, you're giving your body GABA so then it works again. And baclofen is a medicine that we can take four times a day in some cases to help with spasticity. My point here is that if we make your MS slow down and you're miserable, we didn't do a good job. In order to feel like we've made the MS boring so that you can live your best life, we have to slow the MS down and we have to improve the quality of your life by improving symptoms. One of the questions asked was actually about a baclofen pump. Now, the vast majority of people with spasticity are able to manage it the way I just said. Maybe they need to take a few more pills. Maybe they need Botox injections. Sometimes the spasticity is so severe that we have to implant a device in their body that drips liquid baclofen into their spinal sac. And it's amazingly helpful. It's a transformative therapy. And that can make the difference between someone being tight and in pain, writhing and having decubitus ulcers, and being able to stretch and stand up sometimes. It's really, really impactful. That doesn't slow down multiple sclerosis, but it makes spasticity better controlled and it makes MS boring. And so that's really important to me. And again, before I move on to the next topic, I want you to be selfish. When the doctor says, well, that's not that bad, that spasticity's not that bad, remind the doctor that it's not his leg. It's your leg. You're a you expert. You know exactly how that feels. And you're allowed to tell them, I don't think you're picking up what I'm putting down. That's not okay. Be selfish. How else can we make MS boring? We've talked about treating attacks. We've talked about symptoms. Now we need to talk about how we slow MS down. I made up a saying a long time ago that I want you to be four for four in your fight against MS because I thought of four things that I wanted you to do. And when I set up my clinic, I found a telephone number, 614-304-3444, because that was cute and that way you'd be four for four. And that was a perfect slogan until my friend convinced me that I was missing one. It needs to be five for five. I can't get a new phone number, so the phone number is still 444, but I'm going to go over how to be five for five because there are five things that I want you to do to slow down your MS. You ready? That was an audience participation moment where I ask you a question and then you respond. So let's try it again. So I'm going to go through a way to be five for five to slow down MS. Are you ready? Yeah. That was so much better. Thank you. So the first thing that we want to do to slow down MS is to not smoke stuff, All right? Smoking stuff, like if you take a carbon-based life form like this paper and you light it on fire and then you, smoke in, you suck in the smoke, it's really, really pro-inflammatory, All right? And it's very pro-inflammatory to your blood vessels and it's really pro-inflammatory to your lungs and it turns out that it's really pro-inflammatory to your noggin. And so it turns out that if you smoke, you increase the risk to develop MS by double. So smoke or secondhand smoke increases the risk to develop MS. If you already have MS, smoking speeds up MS by almost 50%, which is terrifying. The good news is if you stop smoking, you slow it down. Now that's a really big deal. In the 90s, the first line medicines that came out could slow down MS by 30%. Stopping smoking slows down MS by 50%. You feel me? So smoking stuff can speed up MS and not smoking is one of the most awesome modifiable risk factors that can help slow down MS. Now notice that I keep saying stuff. Why am I saying stuff? Why am I not saying tobacco? Because of wacky tobacco, right? So I am a medical marijuana recommender in the state of Ohio and I'm a big believer in medical cannabis to help MS symptoms, but I am not a believer in lighting cannabis on fire and smoking it for the exact same reason as I don't think it's a good idea with tobacco. All right, so number one in being five for five is to not smoke stuff. Now, in reality, there's a very large conversation behind that about other cardiovascular risk factors. If you have high cholesterol and it's not treated, your MS gets worse faster. 
Allow me to repeat. If you have high blood pressure and it's not treated, it makes your MS get worse faster. One more. If you have diabetes and it's not adequately treated, it makes your MS get worse faster. So controlling cardiovascular risk factor is super duper important. That's number one. Number two is to exercise as part of your lifestyle. Now, it's very easy for me to sit on my fat duff and waggle my finger and tell you to go exercise. Hmm. And I'll even write it in a medical note. I recommend that you exercise. Ha ha. It's very hard for me to go home after working 12 hours and do anything but sit and stare at the wall. All right, and I live in the real world just like you do, and exercise is not fun sometimes, and we're really busy because we have like a spouse, and they want us to do things, and then we have the honeydew list, and we have our kids, and we have a job, and maybe a hobby even, or maybe we want to go to the bathroom. The reality is that people with MS who exercise as part of their lifestyle end up less disabled at the end of their life than those that don't. The reality is that exercising in MS decreases fatigue big time. It improves mood big time. It helps with cognition big time. It helps with balance and controls strength and decreases risk of falling. But let's just do a really quick thought experiment. All right, I clone you. Now I'm gonna to have to get consent from your family, but we'll deal with that some other time. So I have two of you, all right? And I'm gonna give one of the clones Days of Our Lives television. By the way, does that still exist? Good, thank you. All right, so days, th days of Our Lives television and chocolate cake. And the other clone we're gonna put on an elliptical and give carrots, all right? And then we're gonna get back together in like three years. Now I've got one clone that knows every single thing about Days of Our Lives. I mean, she can tell you how Judy was bit by a scorpion and turned into a man, right? I mean, she knows all the things from, from Days of Our Lives and she's an expert at chocolate cake. But she's also gained some extra pounds and she has a really weak core and she's got weak legs and her balance is not awesome and her cardiovascular fitness is not very good, right? Now you got another version, a clone who looks a lot like a Greek goddess and she lost the weight that that person found. She's got a strong core, her legs are strong, her balance is better than it's ever been, her cardiovascular endurance is really on point. Then I'm gonna reach into my jacket and pull out a Harry Potter magic wand and I'm gonna cast a spell and cause an attack, an MS attack of left leg weakness. Now this clone is limping still working out in the gym and going to work. And this clone is stuck in a wheelchair and can't get up. And I'm not gonna insult you right now and ask you who do you wanna be because it's a rhetorical question. I'd rather point out to you that this woman we allowed to become deconditioned. This woman we prehabilitated. Exercising as part of your lifestyle is paramount to making MS boring. Absolutely, that's number two. Number three, number three, is gonna be supplementing low levels of vitamin D. So many of us are Ohioans, and that means that for six to seven months out of the year, we only see the sun like on pictures, you know, because it's really gray out and there's not a lot of sun. And during the five months when we do this, see the sun, we're told don't go out in the sun, God forbid you get cancer, you know, so hide from the sun. The problem is, is that that's how we absorb vitamin D through our skin, through a reaction from the sun. And it turns out that vitamin D levels relate to MS activity. If you have a low level of vitamin D before puberty, it increases the risk to get MS. And if you have MS and your vitamin D is below 50, it drives your disease faster. So low vitamin D is correlated to more attacks, it's correlated to more spots, it's correlated to progression, it's correlated to cognitive problems. And so supplementing your vitamin D is awesome. So how do you supplement vitamin D? Well. You can go to Alaska and kill a polar bear because polar bear liver is super high in vitamin D, but I would not do that. You could go out in the sun shirtless for 15 minutes in full sun and you'll absorb 5,000 international units of D3 and your neighbors will call the police and you'll be really cold. Or you can just take a vitamin D3 pill. Why D3? Because D3 is better absorbed in the human body than D2. How much should you take? I can't answer that question for you. I need to do a blood test to check your level and then based on that, I can tell you. Now, I will share that most Ohioans end up taking about four or 5,000 international units of D3. And then we check the levels throughout the year because we want that level to be above 50. Why? It makes MS boring. Now, in reality, there's a very, very large conversation behind that about diet and exercise and nutrition. And increasingly over the past several years, I've become more and more excited and interested about how nutrition impacts MS. And so I've started more than ever to start to talk to families about what they're eating and when they're eating and how much they're eating. And I've been really excited 
about some situations where patients have shed some pounds and they've regained some function. I'm very proud of that. I think it's kind of awesome. It's outside the context of this chit chat tonight. We'll just stop with supplementing levels of vitamin D. Right? Now, number four is to take the most effective MS disease-modifying therapy that you're comfortable with and make sure it's working. And I tell you, I've crafted that sentence very, very carefully. I want you to take the most effective disease-modifying therapy that you're comfortable with, and I want you to make sure it's working. So let's unpack that sentence. Disease-modifying therapies slow MS down. They prevent attacks. They prevent new brain damage on the MRI, and they prevent disability progression. They're paramount to success in making MS boring. I'm sometimes asked, if I don't take a medicine, what's the likelihood that I'll have NEDA, that I'll have nothing happen? And it's single digits. It's like 9%, 8%, depending on what study you're looking at. I'm not okay with those odds. I want to stack the deck in your favor. All right, and so I want you to take the most effective DMT you're comfortable with. Because maybe the most effective DMT that you're eligible for, you don't feel comfortable with. And it's real big of me to tell you that's a good one. I'm not the one that has to take it. You have to take it. And so I need you to feel okay about taking it. And then we need to make sure that it's working. How do you make sure it's working? Three ways. Number one, I ask you, literally, you're a you expert. Are you failing the litmus test of life? Did you stop going to play Mahjong? What's wrong with that? Are you having MS disease activity? All right, so we can have that conversation. When people come into the Boster Center, we have them fill out these questionnaires, which are really geared at hearing their voice and quantifying what's going on with them. And we spend a long time in clinic talking, trying to understand what's up. That's the number one way that I figure out how we're doing. That's the number one way that I figure out if the medicine's working. The second way is the MS Olympics. So when you come to the Boster Center, we put you in this little room and Amber makes you do all this stuff and move all the pegs and run down the hall. And all of these tests are validated quantitative measures that allow us to measure how you're doing. That silly peg test that you don't like, if it drops 20%, something's very wrong and we need to do work. If your walking slows down 20%, something's wrong. You're progressing in your disability or you're having an attack and I need to look into it. If your COG test drops four points, that's an alarm bell that something's not okay. My point is these tests are another way, functionally, that we can test the drug and see if it's working. Because we want to make sure it's working. Why? Because we want things to be boring. That's very, very important. Make sense? The other way that we do it is by MRI. Structural, all right? So we take pictures, and I don't do that every year the spine, I probably get that every other year. The brain I like to get every year. And we're looking for new structural damage. So imagine that in your basement there's a crack. It was there when you bought the house, right? And so when you went down, you inspected the house and you see a crack, and you go down a year later and look at the basement, and there's still a crack there, but it's not any bigger. There's no water, the thing's not bulging, there's no other cracks, it's the same. There's no new structural damage in that wall, that's good. That's what I'm doing with your MRI. I'm looking to see if there's new brain damage or if the old brain damage got worse, God forbid. And so when we say that we wanna put you on a disease modifying therapy, the most effective one you're comfortable with and make sure that it's working, that's another way that we do that. We ask you, we examine you, and we take pictures of your noggin. Now, that was four for four, and that's where I stopped and that's when I set up my phone number I was very proud of. And I have this friend who's smarter than me up in Cleveland. Uh, her name is Dr. Sullivan. Uh, she is a psychologist at the Cleveland Clinic Mellon Center, probably one of the smartest MS psychologists in the United States, maybe the world. She's a really cool lady. And I was talking to her, and I was telling her how proud I was of making up four for four, and she goes, Boster, it's, it's not four for four. And I said, yes, it is, because I made it up. She goes, no, no, it's not four for four. It's five for five. You forgot mindfulness. And I thought about it, and she's right. And so now I want to talk to you about the fifth and five for five to live your best life despite having MS, to make MS boring. And it's something which is weird in American culture. In fact, I bet you that half this room doesn't know what I mean when I say mindfulness. You're like, what kind of weird word is mindfulness? Mindfulness is a practice where you spend time in the present moment and you're not thinking about what happened in the past. You're not telling yourself movies in your mind about what could happen in the future. You're just existing in the now and you learn to be comfortable with that. And that sounds a little like, like hippy-dippy maybe, 
but I double dog dare you to try it out. It turns out that in our Western culture, there is no opportunities to be in the now. It's, it's something we're not afforded. In fact, in your workplace, if you work at your desk while eating, returning a phone call and an email, they pat you on the back and say, that's a good worker, good job. I would brag to my friends and say, I ate while walking here. So much time I saved, right? I have people that respond to emails going to the bathroom. I mean, we have a culture where we cram everything together and we're rewarded for that, and yet it takes us away from our center. And if you don't believe me, try it. Try spending a couple of minutes meditating. Any of you with a smartphone can download an app and you can listen to it, and it's awesome sauce. I'm gonna tell you something that I do every morning because I'm a weird dude who really, really believes in mindfulness. I have a, a, um, a lifestyle of showering every morning because I don't want my team or my patients to smell me. And what I've started to do is I do shower meditation. So I shower, and then when I'm done, I sit on the floor of my shower, cross-legged, and I close my eyes, and I relax, and I breathe for about 10 to 15 minutes. And when I'm done, I stand back up, and I feel supercharged. Seriously, I'm not a, a, a mindfulness guy, except I've discovered that my life has improved. I, wait, I, I stand up, and I'm ready to tackle the world so I want you to try that. You don't have to do that in the shower. You could do mindful meals. A mindful meal is like circa 1950s. You don't bring your phone to the table. Turn the TV off. There's no radio. Spend some time smelling the food. I mean, mom made it. Spend some time tasting it. Take a moment and be grateful for the people that are around you. Just five minutes. I want you to be five for five in your fight against MS because I want to help you make MS boring. My name's Aaron Boster. And I'm so grateful for this chance to talk to you all. You did something which is less and less common. So you left your homes and you gave up time with your families to come learn something. And it's something that's very important to me. So the next time I see you on a Monday morning YouTube video or during one of my monthly webinars or if you come to visit me at the Boster Center, be safe, everyone, and take care. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Boster. I didn't expect you to be finished so soon. Thank you, thank you. All right, does anybody out here, out here have a question for Dr. Boster? That's great, I'll be to you in one minute. I forgot to announce something at the beginning of this program, all right? I just wanna let you all know. This is a Compass to MS Care program. I did forget to tell you that. It is sponsored by Genentech. I did tell you that, okay? So the question I have is with regard to uh, living in a warmer climate is actually better if you have MS, but with patients that have, that can't stand the heat, what do you recommend? So oftentimes people impacted by MS, when they get cold, they can get stiff with spasticity, the way that I described. Oftentimes those same patients, if they get overheated, they get weak. And so the answer is San Diego, <laughs> where the weather's perfect all year round. Now, many of us don't have that occasion, so we're stuck here in Ohio. And so what we have to do instead is, we have to be planful and adaptive. So I'm a big fan, for example, of cooling vests. Cooling vests have gotten really, really advanced in their technology. I could have a cooling vest on right now and you wouldn't be able to tell. You could wear it under a t-shirt and someone wouldn't know. And a cooling vest can help cool your core body temperature. There are medicines like foraminopyridine, which if you respond to, they buttress against heat sensitivity. So my point here is, if that's a problem, then we treat it. And we can improve your life and make that boring with lotions and potions. God also made air conditioning. Yeah, that's a really, really good thing. Yeah, and they're very fond of it in Florida. That's right, that's right. Anybody else in the audience have a question out here? I will get back to you. I do have a lot of questions to ask from people that are online right now. So I will be back to you. I see you all the way out there. I'll get out to you in a few minutes, all right? First you. Quick question, Dr. Buster. When you're meditating in the shower, is the water on or off? So the water's on. And I share that on my YouTube channel and someone wrote in, that's terribly wasteful. I can't believe that you just sit there and let the water run. That's good, that's great to hear, okay. I hope River is there with you. All right, next, um, a person named Debbie is asking, what should you expect with Ampira? So Ampira, foraminopyridine, or in Europe it's called Fampira, is a medicine, <clears throat> it does, it's not a medicine to slow MS down, it's not a disease modifying medicine. It's a medicine to treat a specific symptom called heat sensitivity and motor fatigue. 
So some people, when they start walking, they're strong, they're fine, but after a while, once their body kind of gets heated up, they become weaker, or they have MS symptoms that come out because of heat. And when their body cools down, they're okay, but it really limits them, because if they go outside in August, they can melt, or if they're trying to exercise, then they can get weak. And if they take Ampira and they respond to it, it buttresses against that. Now, it can take upwards of two months to respond to Ampira. I used to tell people, make sure you take it for a month before you decide, but now I really feel like six to eight weeks is necessary. And at the end of six to eight weeks, you have one of two responses. You either have a, wow, and you won't let me take it away from you because it was really, really helpful, or you'll say, eh. And if you say, eh, then it didn't work. Thank you. Next question. Another Debbie. There's several Debbies online, so Debbie, Debbie, and Debbie, it's one of you. Medications, can you listen medications that are available for secondary progressive? Yep. So doctors like taxonomy. Are you familiar with the word taxonomy? We like to put things in boxes. We like to separate things for our way of thinking. We, we really enjoy doing that. And one of the things we like to do is we, we like to take diseases and put them in little boxes because it makes it easier for us to think about them, even if it's not real. So there's a disease called multiple sclerosis. And in my opinion, it's one disease. And it manifests in a couple different ways. But we're going to talk about relapsing forms of MS. A relapsing form of MS is someone who has MS and has had at least one attack. They have a relapsing form of MS. Now, if you look at that human being, earlier on in their disease course, they have a higher likelihood of having attacks, and they have a slightly lower likelihood of having progression of neurological disability. You take that same human later, several years later, they have a less likelihood of having attacks and a higher likelihood of having progression. And what someone did in the 60s is they drew a line in the sand. They said, we're going to call that relapsing MS, and we're going to call that progressive MS. Except it's not real, because it's a continuum. It's the same human throughout a course of time. And it's not like stage one or stage two of cancer. Why am I bringing this up? Because many, many drugs work to treat secondary progressive MS. Because people with secondary progressive MS are at risk of having attacks. And the MS medicines decrease the risk of attack. People with secondary progressive MS are at risk of having new spots on their MRI, and the medicines decrease spots on the MRI. People with secondary progressive MS have a risk of having accelerated brain volume loss, and many of the newer medicines do an outstanding job of slowing brain volume loss. People with secondary progressive MS have a risk of progression of disability, and these medicines, particularly the newer ones, slow progression of disability. So if you notice, when I say secondary progressive MS, I might as well just say MS because these medicines can work to slow things down and they do a lot more than just treat attacks. Let me make that point to you this way. There was a study done that really bothered me where they took a group of people with MS over 55 and to be in the study you had to have no attacks and no new spots for five years. Right, so all the people in the trial were older than 55 and it had at least five years of nothing's going on. And they stopped half of their medicines and they left them on the other half of the medicine and they saw what happened. And what they concluded was, if you're over 55 and you haven't had any disease activity in five years, go ahead and stop your medicine because you only have a one-third chance of progressing in disability. Thank you. For those in the audience, I will get back out there to you in a few moments. I just need to uh, ask a few more here and then I'll get my body up and going, all right? All right, next, um, uh, Cindy writes, I read today that our body releases cytokines during sleep, which help our immune system. I find this very confusing because I have always thought that cytokines are inflammatory when released. What can you tell me? So cytokine is like a weird word. It's kind of a cool, edgy word, a cytokine. Dun, dun, dun. A cytokine is just a chemical, all right? So immune cells release chemicals. Some of them are called interleukins. Some of them are called cytokines. They're just chemicals to communicate between cells. And cytokines can be pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. It's just a signal. And so I would remove the word cytokine from the discussion and say sleep improves the immune system because it does for multiple different reasons. Thank you. Did I stop you before in the middle of an answer? I can't remember. Keep on keeping on. Okay. All right, next. Cheryl is asking, how do out-of-state MSers get to see you? Love is in the air. No, so you can see me right now. Hi. Hi, Mom. 
Um, so during the COVID-19 pandemic, the United States government did something unprecedented. It liberalized the rules for telemedicine. Prior to COVID-19, telemedicine could only be done after a doctor had physically seen a patient in their office and only within that same state. And the government wisely said, we have to do away with that because we have to improve access to care because people can't get to their normal doctor's offices and hospitals. And as I mentioned to you, the Boston Center for MS opened right as the pandemic started and I started doing telemedicine all over the United States. And we've unfortunately now experienced a rolling back of those regulations. And the governments, uh, the various states are suggesting that doctors stay within their state with their licensure. And so, so what's happened is people can see me if they come to travel to see me. And so, for example, sometimes people fly in twice a year to get therapies and to be treated and see me and do an MRI and all those kind of things, then they fly back to Wyoming or what have you. And there's a lot of different ways of doing that. Now, if you're an Ohio patient, I can see you on telemedicine. And we are eagerly exploring a couple really provocative new ways to solve that problem. There's something that the government has rolled out, Ohio has not accepted it yet, and I think it's called a compact license, but it's a special kind of medical license. And if you're in it, and all the other states that are in it, honor your license. And so I will apply for that the second that Ohio has it available, because I wanna be able to see my patients remotely from other places. Thank you. All right, next, a person writes, um, well, it's not even that one person, there's a lot of people. They wanna know about COVID, and multiple sclerosis. They want to know about why about all these lingering symptoms that are out there with the unpredictable variants and what it can be done about this. So I remember in 2020 when we were going to have an extended spring break. Remember we thought well spring break's probably going to be like three weeks this time. And now we're in our third year of, of, we keep calling it a global viral pandemic, but that's actually inappropriate. It's not a pandemic, it's endemic. So if you look at um, the CDC, actually they, here I'll read, they just put out guidelines today and I'm gonna read them to you and then I'll explain to you why I think this is endemic. All right, so this is the new CDC guidelines. People who are exposed to virus no longer need to quarantine at home, regardless of their vaccine status, although they should wear a mask for 10 days and get tested for the virus on day five, according to new guidelines. Routine surveillance testing of people without symptoms is no longer recommended for most settings. People who test positive for the virus should still isolate at home for at least five days. And the guidelines around masking which recommend that people wear masks indoors in places where communities have high COVID-19 levels have not changed. So, so that's the new guideline from the CDC, which is fine unless you have MS and you're immunosuppressed. Like, it, it, it's, it's, not so, it, it's not so fine. And so we have developed and we have evolved. And if you think about the state of affairs with, with COVID-19 right now, it's a much better situation for my patients than it was a year ago. Why? Because the variants have become less severe. We're seeing less hospitalizations with these newer variants, which is the way viruses evolve typically. The second thing is we now have vaccines that are available. And if you ask me whether you should have a vaccine, the answer is yeah, you should. And if you ask me if you should have a booster, the answer is yeah, you should. Because this virus is weird and people can't maintain their immunity like they normally would. If you are immunosuppressed because you're on a medicine for MS that suppresses your immune system, then you're eligible for a medicine called Evusheld. Evusheld is two monoclonal antibodies in a depot shot that protects you if you contract COVID. You have like gorillas on board that beat it up. And if you are immunosuppressed and you contract COVID, then there's a medicine that I can prescribe you called Paxlovid, which is a disgusting tasting pill that you take twice a day for five days and it's been miraculous. I've lost seven patients to COVID-19. It was all within the first year of the pandemic. And I haven't lost any more patients to COVID-19. But we're not done yet. And the frustration that I have with those CDC guidelines is they are stigmatizing. Because if you're immunosuppressed, I'm gonna recommend that you wear a mask in public. And they kind of create the maskers and the non-maskers, and I don't think that's what we should be doing. What should we be doing? 
It's my opinion that you need to get vaccinated. I feel very passionately about that. We can talk about that sometime. And it's my opinion that you should get boosted. It's also my opinion that if you are immunosuppressed, you have to take some extra precautions. All right, and you can always use Dr. Boster as an excuse not to go to a wedding. Oh, he wouldn't let me. If you have COVID and you contract COVID, I want you to call your neurologist right away because I want to get you on Paxlovid. That's been a game changer. We're not done yet. If you look at this room and the way we've structured the room, it's spaced out more than it used to be. This has changed. Most of my patients have now do some type of hybrid work where they're working at home some, they're going in the office a little bit. I still do 50% telemedicine. So the world is, we're not done with this yet. That was a good question. Thank you for asking. Great, I'm over here. Uh, my question is, I'm wondering about the relationship between um, going off of the disease-modifying therapy and age, um, especially when there is a lot of damage in the cervical cord. So I am of the opinion that we should stop treating you after your death. Because the drugs have not been studied in dead people, and most of the drugs require an intact body to move them around. Like if I set up an IV in a dead person, nothing happens. Or if I put a pill in their mouth. So, so I really don't think that's smart. But prior to death, as long as two conditions are met, I want to treat you. Condition number one is you have an immune system. All right? Because if you have an immune system with MS, it will attack your brain and spinal cord given the opportunity. And the second thing is you have a nervous system with functions that you still like. So if you enjoy swallowing or orgasming or seeing or moving your arm or feeling your leg, those are neurological systems that you have intact. And if you like those, then I want to do things to protect them against your immune system. If you are, say, 70 years old, you're not very likely to have an MS attack. But if you have an MS attack, you're very, very unlikely to bounce back. And so the risk of an attack is lower, but the severity of the attack, if you have it, is much higher. And these medicines do more than just prevent attacks. They slow progression of disability. They slow brain volume loss. Keep in mind that MS is like having your brain in a shredder, like a paper shredder, on low. Whether you're having an attack or not, it's slowly being chewed on. And we can see that with the shrinking brain volume. People impacted by MS who are not treated, their brains can shrink upwards of 10 times faster than normal. And if you stop a medicine, you're doing nothing to help that. And you don't stop shrinking as you get older, and so I want you on a medicine for all of those protections. I feel very strongly about that. Now, there is a plague among some MS doctors. I don't know what happened. I think they got ill. And they got it in their heads that they want to be ageist. And we say, well, if you reach a certain age, then I'm going to stop your medicine. We don't need it anymore. And I don't agree with that. And there's actually some really big studies going on right now intended at trying to answer that question. And so we should have a readout in a couple years. That was a great question. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Next one, Jesse's asking or saying that a friend has trouble injecting herself with Casimpta. She's older and can't get a nurse to come out to her home and help out and wants to know if there's any resources that can help her for free. So here's someone who is treating their MS by taking an injection once a month, except they have trouble giving themselves the injection. And so what do you do? Like, that's tough. So they stipulate that they want help, but that they don't want to have to pay for someone to come in, which I respect. Right, so how do we do that? Well, the first thing you do is you go back to your clinic and you have them retrain you. And the Casimpta team can send a nurse to meet you to train you. Like, so you can practice injecting. And we can first see whether or not we can teach you how to inject okay. We might have to come up with it. Like, if you have trouble with your hand or if you have trouble injecting, we might have to do some things to make that successful. And so that's one of the things that we can do, is you can go back to the clinic and ask to be retrained. You can talk to the company and see if they'll send someone to help retrain you. The other thing we can do is we can see if a village member could inject you. We need to inject once every month. And so is there a village member? Is there someone at your church that can stop by once a month and help you with the injection? Could you bring the shot to the clinic? Could someone there do it for you? Could your aunt come over? Could your, could your nephew come over? Could we arrange to do it that way? There's a lot of things that we can do to explore that. Um, ultimately, if we can't make that work, 
then we would have to come up with a different plan and treat you using a different mechanism. That's not a shot. Thank you. Next, Kevin's asking if you can tell us more about the Ampera. You mentioned it before, but what about, uh, is that better to use in heat than in the cold? So um, Ampera is a medicine that if you respond helps buttress against heat, but it doesn't help you with cold. So if you're having difficulties with cold, we're gonna have to do different things to help with that. Okay, next, uh, Kevin's also asking, what is available uh, with clinical trials? For, why are people aging out of clinical trials? So I was hopeful that someone was gonna ask about clinical trials, because one of the biggest excitements that I have in the MS field right now is we haven't stopped doing research. We haven't stopped at all. The entire time during the pandemic, we have been developing and testing drugs, and very, very brave human beings with MS are volunteering to do trials. So at the Boster Center for MS in Columbus, we have over 40 people that have volunteered their bodies to participate in clinical trials to help try to find a better drug or a new thing. And I'll share with you something I'm very excited about. There are these new type of molecules out, these new pills that are being tested in MS called brutine tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Now that's a law. Now it's abbreviated BTK. And I mentioned a BTK inhibitor and my friend said, oh, bind, torture, kill? So it turns out that there was like a, a serial killer that was called the BTK killer, which has nothing to do with this pill whatsoever. So this is brutine tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It's a pill invented to treat cancer. And it, we tested an MS and it was a rock star. It was so exciting that there are now multiple uh, drug manufacturers that are all aggressively trying to develop BTK for MS. So at the Boster Center, we're doing trials with BTK molecules in relapsing MS in secondary progressive MS and in primary progressive MS. Now the BTK pill is neat, in my opinion, for two reasons. Number one, it does something cool to B cells. So a really great way to treat MS is to murder B cells. If you knock down adult B cells and suppress them, it slows MS down big time. It's a very effective way to do it, but there's a risk of infection potentially. And so we have to grapple with that because it's an immunosuppressant. Well, BTK inhibitors, they block B cell signaling without murder. So it's kind of like they plug their ears and la la la, I can't hear you, but, but there's no increased risk of infection because you're not murdering the B cell. And so that's pretty darn clever. Now the other thing that I think is super, super neat, and this is why I'm most excited in secondary progressive and PPMS, is BTK inhibitors act on a cell we've never been able to reach. There's an immune cell, it's part of the innate immune system, and it's, it lives in the brain, it doesn't go anywhere else, it's called microglia. And microglia remind me of the Incredible Hulk. They just kind of hang out and don't do very much unless they get mad. And if they get mad, they literally change and they start to eat everything around them. And in the setting of MS, they're eating your brain. And we know that they're activated, but we haven't ever been able to get to them. Well, guess what? BTK inhibitors turn them off and they can cross the blood-brain barrier. So I'm really, really excited to test these molecules. And I think that the research is, is really, really rich. But that wasn't his question, his question is why do people age out of trials? And so we have to address that. And the answer is because of math. All right, so let me explain to you. When, you do, when you're a manufacturer, right, and you're running a clinical trial, you have to pay for it, right? And clinical trials are very, very, very expensive. So how much does it cost to do a two-year trial with two different drugs head-to-head? -head? It's about $100 million per arm per year. So, so trials are, are very, very expensive, and they don't want to spend a half billion dollars and not answer the question. So they want to set the trial up to increase the likelihood of seeing an event. So if you look at a group of people with MS who are 30, and you look at a group of people with MS who are 60, the 30-year-olds are way more likely to have attacks, and they're way more likely to have spots. And so if you have to pick a group of people to put in the trial and you picked 30 year olds, you're more likely to see disease activity and you're more likely to prove that it works than if you tested a bunch of 60 year olds. Now that doesn't mean it doesn't work in 60 year olds. That just means that because of the cost of the trial, they're stacking the deck so they can find answers. Then we have to extrapolate that to our patients. Now, do I like that? Well, emotionally, no, I don't like that because I don't like it when someone wants to fight back and wants to participate in a trial and they're not allowed because of age. But statistically, I do understand. 
Now, my last comment is it's getting way, way better. So I'm doing a trial right now where the cutoff age is 58. And that doesn't sound like a lot, but I've never seen 58. I've only seen 55 my whole career. And so the fact that I see a trial that's letting people into 58 is a sign that we're starting to pay attention. And so I think that's actually getting better, not worse. Thank you. We have just under 20 minutes remaining, and we have about 20 questions to ask. All right, one question a minute. Ready, go. First, you mentioned that you prefer people not to smoke cannabis. What better way is taking it? So I think if we're going to use cannabis, we need to know what we're trying to treat. And if it's an acute symptom like pain or spasticity, then I like to use tincture, which you put under your tongue and 15 to 20% is absorbed in your blood vessels within five to 10 minutes. And then you swallow the rest and that kicks in in 45 minutes. And that's my fave. Or you can use a vape pen, which is still inflammatory, but nowhere near as bad as smoking a joint. If we're trying to treat a chronic symptom in the background, like anxiety or insomnia, then I like to use an edible, like a gummy. Great, thank you for that. Uh, next person writes, do you take Evisheld before your Pfizer booster or after? Doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. Next, what happens if you have an attack but MRI does not show any new lesions? Excellent question. It says, what happens if you have an MS attack and they get an MRI and there's no new lesions? So what? You still had an attack. In fact, I don't order an MRI when you have an attack. I don't need an MRI when you have an attack because you told me the answer. So if you have a new loss of function and I can see it on exam, I don't care what the MRI shows. Because the MRI is not the answer. The MRI is a picture and it's not a complete picture. So I think it actually doesn't make much sense to order a scan to prove someone has an attack. They can't move their leg. Give them steroids, make them better. Remember when I said there's three ways that we assess if you're doing okay with the drug? I said, you know, we ask you how you're doing, we examine you and we look at the MRI. If any one of those is bad, that's not okay. So if, and they don't have to line up. So if you're not doing well, but your MRI is, that's not okay. Similarly, if your MRI shows new spots and you feel great, that's not okay. All three have to be copacetic for us to feel good. And they don't have to jive. Next one. Uh, if a person's focus, visual focus goes in and out, what do you recommend? An ophthalmologist. Spell it. I can't. I know. O P T H H T H. Yes. Yeah, the ophthalmologist. <clears throat> okay. Next one. Can you take the uh, MS infusion medication twice a year if you had a cancer? So it depends on what medicine we're talking about. I assume that we're talking about either rituximab or ocrelizumab because those are medicines for MS that are given twice a year. So I'm going to make that assumption. And then we have to decide what kind of cancer you have. And we have to decide whether that cancer is going to be interfered with or treated by the B cell depleter. Certain cancers, that's how we treat them as we give B cell depleters. Certain cancers, that might make it worse. And so it's a conversation between the MS neurologist and the oncologist putting our heads together to game that out. Next one. What do I do if I have nearly constant urinary infections? So that's not uncommon that someone can have recurrent urinary tract infections. And there's a lot of different things that we can do. We can look at managing bowel health and managing in specific constipation or bowel incontinence, which can lead to frequent urinary tract infections. We can use postcoital voiding to try to get the bacteria out of, um, out of the urethra. We can give antibiotics every night before bed or each time before sex. There's, we can do um, drugs like d which change the acidity of the urine so that uh, it's less hospitable for infections. There's a host of things we can do. Is it important? Yeah, it's very, very important because that's gonna uptick your MS symptoms, something fierce. Great, thank you. Any questions out here yet? I'll be you right are. back to you. I'm gonna do this and then get back to you. All right, what really determines when you should change your MS medication, MRI or physical health? What do you suggest? So I think you should stay on your MS medicine unless one of five things happen. And if one of five things happen, I think we need to think about changing. So if you have an attack on the medicine, that's not okay. If you have new spots on your MRI on a medicine, that's not okay. If your exam gets worse on a medicine, that's not okay. 
If you no longer tolerate taking the medicine, that's not okay, and that includes paying for it. And if the medicine is no longer safe, then that's not okay. So if those things happen, we have to think about switching. Otherwise, I want to keep on keeping on. Thank you. Um, can any of the MS drugs actually cause cancer? Can any of the MS drugs actually cause cancer? Yes. In fact, many, many drugs, even outside of MS, can cause cancer. And what we must do, because cancer is scary, is we must place the risk benefit of the drug inside the context of the risk of the disease. For example, there could be a situation where your risk of cancer goes up by 0.2%, for skin cancer. There's a drug that increases the risk of skin cancer by 0.2%. So if I send you to a dermatologist once a year and they get you naked and they look through every crease and crevice and they make sure that all the moles look okay, we're gonna mitigate that 0.2% risk. But if we don't take the medicine, there's 100% risk that you have MS and that it's untreated, it'll progress. And so we can, we can balance the risk benefit and mitigate the risk. So when a drug has a side effect, cancer or another side effect, we have to grapple with that. That's important. But it's also important to keep it in mind that we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Great question. Thank you. Next one. When is taking Tysabri too long to take Tysabri? So you should stop taking Tysabri when you die. We already went over that. And I would not take Tysabri if I had neutralizing antibodies to Tysabri. I would not take Tysabri if I had attacks or new spots on Tysabri. I would not take Tysabri if my JC virus was positive with an optic density above three. Those are the times that I would think about not taking Tysabri. Okay, tell us about steroids and how do you know if a steroid is not good for you? So when you have an attack, remember I was talking about making MS boring and the first thing I said was one of the ways to make MS boring is to identify an attack and treat it. Treating it is most commonly done with corticosteroids, right? And I call them a necessary evil because they're kind of evil, but they're necessary. So the side effects of steroids are unpleasant. It can make you really hungry and food taste bad. It makes you retain water. It makes you super irritable. It makes you have insomnia. I mean, it's, you know, in, in rare cases, it can even do other things like cause GI bleeding or psychosis. All right, so, so, so it's not like they're benign things, but we're using the steroid so that you can regain a function, so that we can quell inflammation in your brain. You can regain your leg or your eye or what have you. Steroids are glucocorticoids, and there's something that we use sparingly, but they can be very, very impactful. A quick comment, steroids in many other conditions are different than the way we use them in MS. For example, other conditions like, uh, say, lupus, you may take 20 to 60 milligrams of prednisone every single day forever. That's a very, very different side effect profile than taking five days of high-dose steroids. They're completely different in, in the side effect and the risk, so you have to keep that in mind. Thank you. Next one. Thought on, your thoughts on stopping MS drugs after 65? Don't. Good answer. Next. Does COVID make MS worse or vice versa? Yes. So there's been some um, epidemiologic studies during the first couple of years of the pandemic, uh, and some of them concluded that, um, that if you have a COVID vaccine, it doesn't trigger an attack. If you have COVID, it doesn't trigger an attack. Or that, and, and that's not... That's true most of the time, but every once in a while I've seen bad things happen. And the most common thing I've seen happen is someone has COVID-19 and they recover from COVID-19 and then they have a long hauler syndrome where a lot of their MS symptoms stink. And their fatigue and their balance and their vision and their pain, it's increased for several months. It's pretty yucky. And sometimes we give steroids and we can quell that. Thank you. What do you tell to people who live in underserved rural areas who don't have any means of support groups and how they can possibly find ways to interact with other patients? This is a great question. So he's saying, if I live in a, like a rural community or an underserved community where, where there's not a lot of resources available for me, how, how do I up my game? And in particular, how do I learn about MS and how do I find support for, for my disease? And if you don't have an MS support group, there's a couple options. Option number one is make one. How do you make a support group? You find two things, a friend and coffee. And now you have a support group. All right, you get together every Thursday, have coffee and talk to one another because you can support each other. How? When you say you're tired, he knows what you mean because you both have a mess. And so you could start a support group, right? And if you're thinking that the town needs a support group, it probably does. Another thing which is awesome sauce is to leverage the interwebs because there are a lot of internet support groups. At the Boster Center, we're actually launching a support group in the next couple months looking at 
caregivers. And we have a patient uh, husband who really, really wants to start a support group for caregivers of people with MS. And that's going to be done virtually. And so if you look online, you can find multiple virtual support groups. Really, really exciting. Great. We're out of time. Well, firstly, I want to thank everybody for being online with us. And I want to thank our sponsors, of course. And I did not get to mention that we had exhibit sponsors from Alexion, Banner Life Sciences, Janssen, Genentech, and TG Therapeutics. And I just wish everybody would, you know, thank them all and be happy that they were all sponsors of tonight's event. And Genentech, of course, was the primary sponsor. And so we want to thank them. I want to thank everybody for being online and everybody that came to tonight's program. So again, thank you for everything. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again.